My name is Kirk Moldoff, and I'm a trustee at the Peak School Museum, and I'd like to welcome you to our History of Fleischmann's, part of our Fleischmann's Celebration and Reunion Weekend. Uh, we had an exhibit at the museum yesterday with a talk by Bob Mayer on the Fleischmann's and baseball. Today, if some of you may have seen the vintage baseball games at Charles Point at the Peak School Stadium, <laughs> which was uh, a lot of fun to watch. And now, before our, uh, our get-together downstairs, I'm going to give a history of Fleischmann's that we put together. Um, and I hope you enjoy it. I usually start off my presentations by making a dedication. And Al Collins, many of you know, lived to be almost 102 years old, was a great Peekskill historian, worked at Fleischmann's for 17 years, and would write columns on a regular basis about Peekskill history. So I thought it was only appropriate to dedicate it to him. But I usually do these at the end, but I thought I'd do these up front. I wanted to give a thank you to a lot of our citizen historians that helped out with this presentation. Uh, actually, first the corporations. The A.B. Mori Company that now owns the Fleischmann's yeast label, the Sazerac Company who owns the Fleischmann's gin and whiskey labels, Entergy at Indian Point, the Peak School Rotary, and the Hudson Hospitality Group, Louis Lanza's company. I'd also like to thank, again, our citizen historians like Val Carano, who's been collecting Peekskill memorabilia for many, many years and donated a lot to our exhibit and slides to this presentation. Donna Marchioni Hayner, who runs several of the Facebook pages like Peekskill, Historic Peekskill and Pictures, the archive edition, um, where she's been posting lots of Fleischmann's imagery for the past uh, few years. Frank Goder, the Peak School City historian, who you know has pictures of just about everything and has helped out with this presentation. And Mike Stewart, who has also not only lives in Gus Fleischmann's house, but has a fascination with Peak School history, photography, and especially what went on on this pier. And of course, my research supported by the Holly and Melinda Ferris oh, Charitable true. Trust. <laughs> So here's the history of Fleischmann's in Peekskill. So my big interest has always been the stove foundries, the Iron Age in Peekskill, but it was coming to an end by the uh, 1900s. The whole waterfront, they used to be solid foundries, some on Main Street and Central Avenue. Only two of them would make it into the 1900s and were gone by 1926. So another company stepped in, the beginning of Fleischmann's which starts with Charles Fleischmann, who was an immigrant from Austria-Hungary, who came to the U.S. in 1868, along with his brother Maximilian. Now, he had come, according to legend, to his sister's wedding, and noticed that the rolls and the bread in the U.S. had no taste, or had kein gut Geschmack, as they would say, back in the home country. His father was a baker, and had developed a dry yeast which, as opposed to liquid yeast, spreads more evenly in the product and doesn't have a lot of the impurities that will affect the taste of the bread, making it actually pretty bitter. He had a number of patents because one of the things about the fermentation process uh, when you're making yeast is that one of the byproducts is grain alcohol. So they, he also had a, a patent on a device to harvest um, yeast foam from the beer making process. Now, he had a very heavy German accent and people were afraid that his product might make their bread taste like beer. Um, and it could be that the accent, he had a hard time convincing bakers, especially you know the commercial bakers, not just home bakers, to use his product. So he had an idea. They had gone into business with a distiller named James Gaff and they went to the 100th you know, anniversary, the Philadelphia Exposition, in 1876 and set up the Vienna Model Bakery because you know, he had come from that area and wanted to demonstrate how these delicious goods which you could eat there were made. They were demonstration bakeries. They showed you how to proof yeast, how to mix it, how to make the dough. Millions of people saw this and it became wildly popular. This is the ad from the uh, trade card about the show of Gaff Fleischmann and Company. 
So the Vienna model bakeries were set up in cities all across the country. Uh, this one was on 10th Street and Broadway in New York, also wildly popular, and the yeast brand began to really take off. Here's an old photograph of it. The bread line, Louis Fleischmann, uh, who actually ran this bakery, you've heard the expression being on a bread line, right? Well, it didn't exist before Louis Fleischmann offered a loaf of bread to somebody who was standing over the grates, because below ground were, were where the baker's ovens were. And he was dying for a loaf of bread. He asked him if he was hungry, would he want one? And he gave it to him. He was very happy to accept it, offered him a cup of coffee, and then said, if you have any friends, have them come down. Within a week, there were 500 men waiting on what was the first bread line. So Louis Fleischmann then had some of the men followed home that weren't eating the bread on the spot, figuring they had families and started uh, a free employment service um, paid for by the Fleischmann Company to try to find them jobs. So the Vienna restaurants and bakeries were very popular around the country. The product took off with a lot of its early advertising. And one of the things was their label. The trademark laws weren't that strong back then. So they always had in their advertising, make sure this is not a counterfeit label, this is the real thing. And if you save these labels from your packages of yeast, you could use these early promotions. These are early trade cards from the late 1800s, which will have a, something cute, a three-minute egg. You know, he's an egg who's a bicyclist with the Fleischmann's label and logo above it. But on the back, you could order, depending how many labels you had, you could order silverware. If you did enough baking, you could get a full set of silverware eventually. These were your first premiums before green stamps or plaid stamps. Another trade card, you could get these handsome, um, you know, picturesque banners to hang and use as decorations in your house. A lot of you who collect these type of things, you'll see them with different kinds of advertising. But Fleischmann's were great when it came to promoting their product. So it became so popular that they needed to expand production. They originally started out in Riverside, Ohio, and looked for a place that had access to the water for transportation, to the rails to get into New York City to their major market quickly, because it was a perishable product back then. It had to be shipped wet and refrigerated. And then also, one that had a, a local source of pure fresh water. And Peekskill had one of the early reservoir systems in the area. So they found the old Charles Southern Brickyard. So we all know there's a big brick industry besides the foundries. There were 29 foundries between Peekskill and Croton Point. Produced a million bricks per day. One of the large ones next to the Bonner um, Brickyard was the Charles Southern one, which was empty and not being used. So they purchased all the property the amount of acreage varies depending what depiction you read, but it went up to about 100. My friend Rob Doyle collects Hudson River paintings, and this one by Charles Ferricks was from about 1860 and shows Travis Cove at that time, because we all think of everything as developed and not as Peekskill as wild and natural. But here's a Hudson River painter showing a skating scene from back then. And this picture that Frank O'Dare printed is also on Travis Cove, on the north side of Travis Cove. Right now, you would actually be standing under the walkway that goes around it. And you can see this little house appears in a lot of uh, paintings by Frank Anderson. And these kids are actually, uh, they're skinny dipping. If you zoom in on this, this kid's mooning somebody. I don't think intentionally. Anyway, uh, Fleischmann's came here and broke ground May 18th of 1899. And within a year, actually within six months, because they dated as 1900, they were already producing here. But they had to put in a street, and the town was giving them a hard time. Louisa Street didn't exist, but they needed an access road. Before then, you're kind of taking your chances crossing the tracks. So does anyone know why it's named Charles Point? Charles Fleischmann, here you go. So for this young lady, we have a we have a packet of activated dry yeast. Very good, like you need that. Go home, bake us some bread tonight. Anyway, at the museum we have a wonderful uh, original uh, engraving of the plant. 
And this is a whole series of those engravings. Uh, showing in the foreground, these were the, the original gin houses and whiskey areas. Back here was the vinegar part. The granary that appears in all of these was capable of holding anywhere from 225,000 to 330,000 bushels of <coughs> grains, barley, wheat, rye, corn. The dock over here uh, would take in 5,000 tons of coal per month that were burned. The plant had one and a half million um, square feet under cover, under roof. The amount of railroads, you see trains everywhere here, but of course in these lithographs they really try showing off. Uh, there's estimates of anywhere from five to 15 miles of track, which may include actually a lot of the sidings uh, on the main New York Central line. This is an early view of the docks on that side. Uh, this is the big granary and the elevator for getting the grain off the boats. A lot of it came from the Great Lakes. And then this is the, uh, the coal elevator for unloading the coal from the barges. This is one of the early postcards uh, Val Corrado has in her collection. And this is a view, the castle-like structure over here are the offices. You see the early power buildings. And along here, some of the grain storage buildings. And a much deeper and larger Travis Cove. The plant expanded over the years. At its peak, it's listed as 125 buildings. But if you look uh, afterwards on the blueprints on the wall, there are actually about 160 structures at its peak. This is my favorite. It's the tinted postcard version. You can find these online fairly easily. They're usually written all over with people's notes. And then once you know the airplanes started taking photographs, the aerial views, we aren't here yet. So you can date this as being before 1929-30, you know. Uh, the Sanborn fire insurance maps, if you're really curious as to what was going on, are a great place um, to see what was going on in the plant. This again is the blueprint, and as you zoom in on it, you'll see the number of buildings. Here's where we are today. The only two buildings remaining, uh, that's the reducing and bottling uh, buildings where we're in right now for the gin and over here are the remaining two vinegar buildings all of these little circles will be vinegar um, vinegar tanks for creating the vinegar they're called vinegar generators because Fleischmann's a gin distillery something that they noticed that you know there since alcohol was a byproduct of that not only was alcohol but vinegar was another byproduct and vinegar was very useful uh, to make munitions, for cooking, for health purposes. But the one thing it's really known for is gin. So anyway, I thought I'd take a little break now. <laughs> because, you know, Because when I'm working on a long historic preservation speech, I kind of long for the crisp, clean taste of Fleischmann's gin. Distilled right here in this building for generations. Here we're demonstrating a simple gin and tonic. As you can see, it is clean, 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 clean. A little bit of lime, and there is nothing like it. So, when you go out to any of your local eating establishments or restaurants in Peekskill, and you notice that they don't serve Fleischmann's anymore, you tell them that this is the original stuff. Since 1870, when Charles Fleischmann started making it, and for no other reason, because there's nothing more Peekskill than Fleischmann's. <laughs> anyway, in the winter, if you're down here uh, at the factory or complex looking out by Travis Cover on the river, you're going to see a ton of eagles. And I'm sure this is pure coincidence. This is a picture I took last year. But in their advertising, they had the eagle. The Fleischmann eagle points the way to quality in whiskey and gin. 
Now, nowadays the cigarettes are kind of optional uh, when you enjoy Fleischmann's, but they were known for their preferred blended whiskey. It's not 90 proof anymore. Um, back then, it actually could probably take the paint off a car, I think. But, um, and the first gin in America. So the Sazerac company now owns the Fleischmann's label. And when I told them that we were having an event in the gin house, in a restaurant that didn't serve Fleischmann's, they were very generous and donated several cases of their product. So afterwards, we're going to have a tasting downstairs, uh, outside. Uh, just make a donation. We have mixers, and you can sample your good old the drink your dad drank and your uncle drank, and maybe your mom. Um, <laughs> Fleischmann's whiskey and gin. So the beginnings, this is some of the earliest photos we have at the Peekskill School Museum. Uh, this is outside the office building, which was a castle-like structure right over the tracks, you know, after you came over the Louisa Street Bridge. And one of the earliest photos inside the whiskey house. Now, something people don't realize, they would talk about bonded whiskey. Uh, there were alcohol purity laws that started being passed because people would doctor whiskeys, doctor all kinds of alcohols. So you actually had government warehouses with a government employee there that were under padlock. Actually, somebody yesterday, um, Pam Charles, just met her. She grew up on Lent Avenue. Her father was an engineer here. And she has some of the original locks that we used to lock, padlock these things because they had to stay. Uh, and be aged at least four years. So vinegar in World War I, uh, a great use for vinegar. And we don't have much on the vinegar plant. Uh, Mike Stewart had found this. One of the transport vehicles, because this was the second largest, it became the largest yeast factory in the world and the second largest vinegar producing factory in the United States. Vinegar is acetic acid. It's kind of a dilute version of acetic acid. Um, and the original pipes had to be made of wood because, um, I'm sorry, can't hear back there? Speak louder? OK, sorry. I think there's a volume here somewhere. How's that? Is that, is that a little loud enough? Sorry. OK. But I won't start from the beginning. Anyway, vinegar is very corrosive, so it was we travel on the rails in large wooden tanks and wooden tanker cars. And the, wooden, the pipes here were originally wood. They had a coopersmith shop where they actually made wooden pipes and wooden barrels to store these products in. Uh, during World War I, uh, the factory was a huge producer uh, for the armed forces of vinegar, acetic acid, to be used in munitions. Unfortunately, tragedy befell. Peekskill's greatest tragedy, uh, just before midnight, it was actually not on August 1st, but July 31st, a fire broke out in one of the grain buildings. And seven firemen lost their lives. It was the greatest tragedy Peak School had ever seen. And it really wasn't the fire that caused it, but in trying to rescue one of the firefighters or factory employees, a wall collapsed because the grain had swollen with all the water that had been poured onto it. And this shows where the approximate location of the wall that collapsed and where the fire started. This is James H. Selleck on the right, one of the casualties of the fire. Here again, somebody as our museum collection had noted in an old article, writing down a little history, because a lot of this had details had been forgotten. And every year at the monument, you may not have noticed it if you're not from Peekskill, but if you are, you probably have. Originally, there was a plaque in the old hospital, which now is at the, uh, at the new one. Um, but the monument here is opposite the octopus, in front of the vinegar building. And every year on August 1st, the Peekskill Fire Department pays tribute to those that lost their lives in the Great Fire. They were Dr. Charles R. F. Green, Clarence J. Lockwood, James H. Selleck, Louis A. Barmore, George A. Caselis, John F. Torpy, and Walter Cole. So the process of making what happened out on the pier, 
But there are all types of things, like this universal Uniflow engine produces 70, 150, 750 kilowatts of power, that enormous power plant that not only produced uh, steam and electricity for the, for the plant, but powered a number of different processes. This is called a corn cooker, which prepares corn for the, in, as mash. These are souring tanks where lactic acid would be added to the mash as part of the fermentation process. This is a view uh, from Val Carano's collection of the still house. And these are centrifugal separators for the yeast process to get rid of the wort or excess water from the process of making yeast. And then these are the yeast presses where they try getting rid of every last bit of moisture that was in the yeast to make the new yeast cakes. So Prohibition put a big kink into Fleischmann's uh, Distilling Corporation. But they wrote it out and they kept the equipment in good shape because they knew sooner or later this would end. Uh, but to weather through it, uh, J.P. Morgan organized a number of companies to get together and form standard brands. Uh, they were Chase and Sanborn, they had Fleischmann's Margarine, Royal Gelatin and Pudding, came on board, tender leaf teas, blue bonnet margin, margarine, and a few others. At this point, the Royal Gelatin plant was built on Charles Point, then expanded, and this ad reflects how much their sales increased. In fact, they won a suit against Jell-O for the original gelatin and the uh, um, formula. Their advertising promotion was phenomenal. If you go looking online, there's just tons of it. It's really great marketing. And one of the early things they did, besides having demonstration bakeries, there was one in the Bronx that had taught 3,000 bakers how to use the product. But for everybody at home, for housewives, house men weren't really doing a lot of baking yet, but uh, they would have these cookbooks that would show you how to use their product. And they had one of the first great logos. There he is holding up a yeast cake. It's John Doe. His body is a loaf of bread. He's got a muffin for a head. Um, and actually, muffin head is something you get if you drink too much Fleischmann's products. And loaves of bread for his arms and legs. He was very, very popular. And inside, they showed you, besides the recipes, here's how to work with the project, product. And they continued these you know, through the whole existence of the company. They had a presence at the 1939 World's Fair. There's a Chase and Sanborn Coffee Building and the Fleischmann's Building next to it. And locally, they even had some of the ladies that worked at the plant to come out. This was a, a Chamber of Commerce exposition that was held at the Armory on Washington Street. Yeast packing, these are really uh, classic photos. And they've been reprinted a lot taking the packages, the yeast cakes, putting them in boxes. This is from the 30s from the museum collection. This one appeared on the cover of the book about the Fleischmann's family. The war years um, actually saw an expansion of the plant. It went from either uh, up to 1,000 to 1,100 workers uh, around the clock, seven days a week, three shifts a day. The advertising reflected it because there were vitamins to be found in yeast. It wasn't just to make bread taste good. And this was no time to be frail during World War II. You should eat more bread. Your trigger fingers would be more steady. You could do better work in the factory. There was no end to the advertising. And I'm not sure that the, uh, the baker in here, that later he got a better contract with Chef Boyardee, because he kind of looks <laughs> like the same guy there and made it onto the pizza boxes a year later, you know? holding up. Anyway, one of the great innovations that happened during the 30s that they really took advantage of in the armed forces was activated dry yeast. Fleischmann's had developed a product that didn't need to be refrigerated. It had no moisture in it whatsoever. Once you added liquid back to it, it became an active yeast product again, which is very useful if you're fighting a war around the world. So for doing this, they won the Army and Navy E for Excellence Award for the first time in 1943. It made headlines. There was a whole supplement issue, which we have 
on exhibit, courtesy of Joan Miner at the Peekskill Museum, where right now we do have an exhibit that'll be up for months um, about Fleischmann's in Peekskill. Anyway, it was quite a big event. They gave out several thousand free newspapers because there were, as you can see, there were 2,000 at the awards ceremony that was held in one of the Fleischmann's warehouses. Here's Gus Fleischmann, plant manager, and some army officials examining the yeast. We have a whole, uh, one of the old managers at the plant donated to the museum um, a whole portfolio full of pictures from the event watching bread being made, examining the loaves of field bread. And there's a Peekskill High School marching band that performed marching past the vinegar tanks. It's a priceless photograph. But everybody was so proud. Everybody had relatives working in the plant. In fact, during the war, um, Standard Brands, Fleischmann's, was the largest contributor to the war bonds effort in Peekskill. Peekskill sponsoring a total of five bombers that all had Peekskill in their names for the war effort. This is the ceremony with Gus up at the podium. The Peekskill High School Band, great uniforms. I imagine they were red, I don't know for sure. They were the same ones in the 1960s until they got new ones. Yeah, same one. Okay. And here they are proudly holding up the flag for the Army Navy. But it wasn't just the plant that got the award. Here's a program uh, from the celebration. And then everybody, this is Frank Hughes, got a certificate uh, for the excellence in production from the Army and Navy. And a little pin. It's a tiny pin to wear on your clothing. The E for excellence. So this is from World War I but I'm gonna stop here to make another pitch for the Peekskill Museum. A lot of what we've shown here today is because of the, um, the volunteer efforts, people donating things over the years, people coming forward to help out at the museum, and we need you. We need your help, we need your support financially. This weekend has been a tremendous success, but we still love your stories, we love your articles in the newspapers, any items about Peekskill, and we need you and your time. We have formed a Friends of the Peekskill Museum organization. You can call the museum and uh, leave a message and we'll be making announcements about having a first meeting of that. And talking about your memories, there's a gentleman named Mike Miner behind the camera over there. And he's video our videographer for today's events, the baseball game and this. So if any of you in the audience, raise your hand if you either worked at Standard Brands Fleischmann's or had relatives or stories about it. Okay, that's great. So all of you, you not only get a package of yeast, but <laughs> come forward and claim it afterwards, but please, after this talk, come over and see Mike because he wants to hear your stories and they're gonna be put on film for posterity as a historical record. Because something we never remember to do with our, um, especially our older family members, is take down their histories, their testimonies, you know, of what life was like. And something with Fle like the history of Fleischmann's is enormous in the history of Peekskill. You know, for 77 years, it was the major part of this town, largest employer, best paying employer. Everybody worked here in the summers. George Pataki worked here during the summers, you know. Um, but the amount that's actually written down about the day-to-day -day life and processes, we now have been seeing little glimpses as we've been putting these photographs out on Facebook. Whiskey and gin. These pictures are from a, a publication Standard Brands uh, produced called Inside SBI. And I've been posting these lately and it's been a great response because, oh, that's my mother, that's my mother and my aunt, that's my dad, that's my uncle. So here's some of the gentlemen from the distilling department. This is from January 1959. In the whiskey department, they had different rolls, blenders, because they would make a number of different products here. It was just, just straight whiskey. There was preferred, there were blended, there were bonded. Later there were scotches, vodkas, gins. Okay, and why are we applauding? Uh, we recognize you. That's our dad. Which one? In the middle. Very good. 
Ever, very good. Ever Murray. And he lived a long, happy life. Okay. <laughs> and then th these are the whiskey bottling line operators. There are two photographs. They focus more on the whiskey in this issue than they did gin. If anybody has any of these issues around, we would love to see them. But you look at them and you recognize a lot of the, the town family names here. And the warehouse men, it wasn't just distilling, it's packing on the line, it's working in the warehouse, it's loading the trains, it's working in the engineering department, the drafting department, there was a sewing department. There was a cooperage, there was a blacksmith, there was a copper shop. All kinds of trades worked here. Anyway, Fleischmann's, it's a big hit. Three ways, gives you choice quality. It's 90 proof. It's preferred. <laughs> so, you know, if you're, again, working on a presentation or whether you're kind of bothered by, you know, what's been going on with the defacing and destruction of the Riley building and want to take the edge off. Yeah, I know. Anyway, you know, reach back. Have some Fleischmann's preferred. Whoa. <laughs> Surprisingly smooth. <laughs> and when you go to your local eating establishments or restaurants or liquor store and they don't have it, tell them, ask them why. We talked to the distributor and she seems to think Peekskill fell into some kind of a hole in distribution. I find it odd that a town that made it, especially made the gym right here, doesn't serve it. So for no other reason, although Dylan's does carry it actually, um, so head down to the old standard house um, and buy it. Why? Again, everybody? Because there's nothing more peak skill than Fleischmann. Very good. <laughs> okay, and again, downstairs, we will have a tasting provided by the Sazerac company for you. Just drink responsibly and get someone else to drive you home. Thank you. Uh, back to the gin department. Again, these scenes took place in this building, one of the uh, three remaining buildings. There are the two vinegar buildings that are now the atrium, and then it's this building that was the gin house. The gin bottling line. These views are from the 1930s. And this just could be the photograph. I don't think he was drinking on the job. Yes? <laughs> the ladies that were in the, the picture before, are those all uniforms? They, yeah. This is, you know, in the days when it wasn't just the wear what you want to to work day, you know. People had uniforms. This was run as a very clean antiseptic establishment, you know. There was a quality control laboratory. What's interesting is if you look, uh, there's Pilgrim's rum that was being bottled here. The first amaretto in the country was made here. Um, they were also putting out vodka, the various types of gin and the blended whiskeys, and they had a quality control. They also had a quality control laboratory. Uh, one of the uh, elderly residents at Drum Hill, I gave a talk there, and she told me that uh, her mother worked in the yeast laboratory because you constantly have to check to see if the yeast is working the way it should. And they would make every day, they would make hundreds of test loaves of bread, seeing how it was rising, then bake them. And especially during the depression, at a certain time of day, all the kids from the neighborhood would come down to the plant and they would give them these little miniature round loaves of bread. These are the kind of stories that people have not written down, but are they're wonderful. The people of Fleischmann's, they had lunchrooms around the facility. For recreation, uh, this is a classic photograph, kind of goes along with today's events. Um, this team is, uh, according to Bob Mayer, from the 1920s or 30s. Peak School, New York, home of the world's largest yeast factory. And they had a bowling league. This is the preferred team from the preferred whiskey. And this is the laboratory team. And there were lots of these teams, but we only have pictures of a few of them. 
Uh, they had a softball team that played in the softball leagues. I believe this is up at Depew Park. And then they would have roller skating teams and parties at the roller drome in town. They won a number of safety awards. The safety slogan contest. And this one with Dr. Lowy in the foreground, we're not even sure what it was for, you know, for safety of the, uh, of the employees. The Quarter Century Club was a real honor. You know, I know Roby Perry, who is it? Your, My grandfather. His grandfather was a Quarter Century Club member. Why wouldn't you? They paid great. This is a great job, you know. You'd want to send around, and they, and they really respected your loyalty. And they would give you, um, I'm not sure if that's a watch or a fob or you know, a certificate that goes along with it, but these are members of the Quarter Century Club. Transportation, Fleischmann's had one of the first fleets of trucks in the country to deliver their products. Started out as wagons in the 1800s, and then as soon as Model A's came out, and Model T's, they were using them to deliver their products, especially when they became standard brands, they would use advertising. And these fleets would make sure that bakers and stores all over the area and the country had their product. This wasn't the only plant that was the largest. Molasses is the major substrate in the yeast making process. It's what yeast feeds upon. They needed hundreds of thousands of gallons and had these enormous tanks that you can see in the old photographs and in the blueprints on the ground. So in 1938, they completed the first ocean going dock. Um, which is called the Molasses Pier or the Fleischmann's Pier. It had nothing to do with China ever, <laughs> as Al Collins would tell you. <laughs> and this, uh, Mike Stewart located online. He's a professional librarian and researcher. Originally, they had locomotives uh, around the property, but John Faulkner, one of the old time summer employees that I knew and was interviewing for another project, told me about this, which you would get a charge of steam from the power plant and then just operate on this reservoir of steam. And with luck, the operator made it back to the power plant before he ran out of steam. You know. <laughs> but these were used in a lot of factories around the country because they didn't produce sparks, you know, they didn't, and uh, they were much safer. Their advertising is wonderful. So one of the things Fleischmann discovered is that in their laboratories, that if you expose yeast to uh, ultraviolet light, it produces much more uh, of the vitamin, especially vitamin D and ergosterol. So they used this in their advertising, and they employed J. Walter Thompson to find new uses for yeast. Excuse me. <laughs> Anyway, they had the Rudy Valley uh, Fleischmann's Hour, which later became the um, Royal Gelatin Hour radio show. Used him in advertising, again, for that subtle added ounce of energy. Maybe your kids got problems at schools. Well, give them more yeast. <laughs> if we could only see the real cause of a child's school troubles, or for that matter, a grown-up's life problems, we'd know. And then again, you know, there's the, uh, the baker telling you to buy Fleischmann's Enriched High B1 Yeast. Acne, you know, mother, can't we do something about my face? Adolescent pimples can make your girl or boy moody and self-conscious. The cure, it's Fleischmann's yeast. Uh, uh, isn't yes. it true though that during prohibition when they couldn't sell anything, that's what they did? They promoted the- They found, the other, they found other ways to, uh, for have, to have people use their products. It's very clever, you know, and they managed to weather prohibition very well. She'd been constipated since childhood. <laughs> Man, I thought I've had bad bouts, you know, but since childhood, anyway. So yeah, nothing like it, because you can see there is the Ingevanden and the Mog and the Heart and the Labor. You've got uh, some kind of blockage going on. And the cure, Fleischmann's yeast. In fact, even in storefronts, this is from an old drugstore in New York, Fleischmann's yeast corrects the world's worst ailment, constipation. I never realized, you know, I thought it was cancer or something. Here you go. You'll like yeast this way. Gosh, you look swell. Been eating yeast again? Anyway. 
No, I've been drinking it. I love Fleischmann's yeast and tomato juice, too. And here you go. Now you'll really like yeast. I couldn't imagine putting yeast in a glass of tomato juice. But anyway. And then again, um, the whiskeys and gins, phenomenal marketing campaigns. It's part of the house. This is a whole series. Uh, Mike Stewart has these in his house. You know, a cocker and a cocktail have a lot in common. I, I'm not sure really what they have in common. But it's a great ad for Fleischmann's gin. Learn about a Collins from a Collie. It, you know, it's kind of like a topper. They had the dog that drank all the time. Maybe this was going around in the, during that period. And this one I love. This is a scratch and sniff ad. You can actually scratch this and smell Fleischmann's gin. The sniff that launched a million sips. This is great. J. Walter Thompson at its best. And this one, well, Freud would have a field day with this, because she's admiring the size of this guy's Fleischmann's. I don't know. That's the one they raised the Fleischmann. Anyway, of course, you know, the workers wanted to protect themselves. They had a very strong union presence here. And there were strikes that went with it for the yeast makers union, local. There were other locals that tried protecting their rights. And one can't say that that's anything having to do with a reason. Like most corporations, uh, they had mergers, they were looking at higher costs of operating, and eventually they decided to start moving operations elsewhere in the country. So the end of an era came in the 70s. They started knocking buildings down, moving things to other parts of the country. And it went from this incredible complex, here we are today, here's the two vinegar buildings that remain, to sadly this in 1981, where you can see the vinegar building, this, the remaining molasses tanks, the housing, there used to be housing that they provided, company housing for a number of the employees on top of what was called the hill. Um, John Walsh Boulevard didn't exist yet, it was put in later. But it's kind of a tragedy, but it's happened all around the country. Um, and it was the end of an era, but a good time, and it's fond memories, and it's something that everybody here is really proud of. So thank you so much for coming. Again, those of you, please come have some yeast downstairs. Uh, we are going to have a tasting. We're outside. Those that signed up for the buffet dinner, it'll be out there. We'll have a tasting. If you want to make a donation to the museum, Sazerac was nice enough to donate a uh, pretty decent supply of gin and whiskey. Um, just again, drink responsibly. Donate very responsibly and very heavily. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you. Um, my name is Jerry Selleck. I'm the grandson of James H. Selleck, who died in the Fleischmann fire. He was a first lieutenant at the Cortland Hook and Ladder. He also worked at Fleischmann's as a blacksmith, and his wife worked at Fleischmann's in the yeast factory. Um, of course, it was a great tragedy for Peekskill and for my grandmother. My father, uh, James Robert Selleck, was only 14 months old, so he never knew his father. And they had to go back and live with her parents uh, because they couldn't afford to continue living. They lived on Dykeman Street at the time. And uh, I know Mr. Fleischman sent them and everybody who had somebody that died a $1,000. Um, and I remember some sad stories, like she tried to collect workman's comp uh, because he worked at the factory, but because he died fighting the fire, it, it wasn't eligible for workman's comp. Um, and of course, she kept all the literature, all the newspapers from both 1918 and in 1938, which was a more tragic description of the fire, who they dug out first from the bricks, because most of the men were buried alive. And one person, I guess Sells died first. He saw the wall bulging, and he went to save them, the other firemen, and they were all buried alive, too. So it wasn't a very uh, you know, pleasant death. And, 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 and one last thing, what could you remember, a happy moment? That you, uh, you I remember happy pictures. I used to see of my grandfather and grandmother taking strolls 
in a Depew Park, and they were all dressed up in their finery. My grandmother with a big feather on her hat, her name was Theodora Travis, a maiden name, and my, everybody was always dressed up back then. Um, and I saw where they took their uh, honeymoon in Atlantic City, I have a lot of pictures of them on the boardwalk down there. Um, I can't, but I know they're, they were married maybe, I don't know, I think about four years, 1914 they were married. And my grandfather was 29 when he died. Hi, I'm Donna Marshone Hainer. I grew up in Peekskill, New York. And this is my sister. Joan Miller Sereccia. I grew up in Peekskill. And we're here to talk about um, uh, your, your family members who work at Fleischmann's. Yes. Please, anything that right. we can start with. Well, my dad was in the Navy first, and when he got out of the Navy, and he's 19 years old, in uh, 1949, he began on the coal cars in Fleischmann's, shoveling coal back in for the burners and all, and taking things off the trains. Uh, he worked his way up over the years to become manager of the plant, uh, and he was in the operators. Operating engineers and union. in the boiler room. Right, he was here till they closed the plant production in 1977. Um, and uh, they transferred him to a plant in Dallas, Texas from here. Um, his brother was a boss over him. The brother was um, Bill, Miller. Bill Miller and my dad was Richard, and they called him they Dick, called him Dick, Dick Miller. Miller. Yeah. That's a, that was some pretty hard, hard work. Right? It was a very laborious, yeah. back-breaking work. Right. You, could you remember your father, father's coming? Do. Let's talk right. about that. Your dad I, coming home from work and what that I was, was like, and what your memories were. What were some more of those yeah, memories? I was little, but I do remember him coming in covered with coal soot, and I could only see his eyes, <laughs> and it was a little scary because I was I was a little kid. Um, but I do remember that very vividly. Him coming mm -hmm. in just covered, and my mom would be like, "No, stand mm -hmm. by the door and take them." <laughs> you know. Right. Yeah. What, is, what are some of those right. memories for you? Well, I, I wasn't there because I grew up in my grandparents' house. Okay. Uh, we're half sisters. She's my stepsister. Uh, but one of the things I remember with my dad also, he took us down to the plant. Uh, we were up on the roof, up on the roof looking down, because you really weren't allowed to roam around the plant if you didn't work there and so on. Um, but uh, one of the other things is when we got a project in elementary school at Hillcrest, the major boss of the plant then was Richard Cruzy. And Richard's daughter was in class with me, Mary Cruzy, who's living in Florida now. And we had to have an exhibit in our fifth grade classroom of what our fathers did for work. Okay. And so they provided everything and we set up a miniature plant on the countertop in our classroom. So I remember that vividly. Another thing I remember uh, that my dad taught me or told me in the 60s and all, he wanted to work his way up in standard brands. And they were very nice to send him to courses to learn refrigeration, sewage, because he had to put all the water back into the river and it had to be clean. So he had to know all about these things. And so he went through every course that they provided for him to work his way up to the powerhouse manager. Wow. He would tell me, that's a, that's PSI. It's whatever that stood for but he was always yeah, trying pounds to, per square inch yeah. yeah and i'm like okay <laughs> but i remember right. going on to, he took me through the plant quite often and he would let me look in the boilers and they were firing mm -hmm. and you could see the fire inside the window and i had to stand on a stool to look in wow. through the window and walking through the plant and of course that vivid smell and um things would drip on my head and I think it was vinegar right, I don't even know right. and I have to walk over puddles of stuff and right it was it's very stuck in my memory for years tours for years yeah. my dad was on the bowling team and they yes. bowled at the bowling alleys there, in, there yes. in Peekskill yeah. first in Peekskill yeah. and then down at Starlight in Croton yes. right. so he was there for yeah. many years I'm Sharon Murray Clevey and I, I live in Connecticut and my father was Edward Murray He's shown in one of the pictures on the wall. Uh, he worked in the gin department and in the yeast department, and later became the traffic manager for the company. And uh, he uh, retired in uh, 1977, but then they hired him back, and he worked for uh, the New York corporate office 
uh, in the archive department, worked with the lawyers for about two years. And I'm Kathy Harrison. I'm her younger sister, uh, Kathy Murray Harrison. And um, I remember um, he was in transportation, and uh, he would have to meet the boats in the winter in the morning, and he'd have to call to you know if there was too much ice, too much snow, um, and he would meet the boats and. I was afraid of spiders at the time, and he was telling me how some of the boats had bananas on them and big spiders like tarantulas, so <laughs> I had nothing to worry about. Okay. Um, but he would come home for lunch every day, visit he us, would. then visit, Verplank is where he grew up, he'd visit his mom, uh, and then he'd go back you lived to in work. Peaksville. Did you live in Peekskill at the time? We lived in Buchanan. Buchanan. Okay. Yeah. And uh, of course, we had an aunt, uh, an uncle who worked uh, for uh, Fleischmann's, cousin who worked for Fleischmann's, and uh, uh, many people in our uh, area worked for the company. And just do one last thing, as, as uh, you know, I, I, I'd asked before the two sisters that were just sitting here prior to you, any sp particular memory of dad or, or any stories that you heard, either funny or humorous or anything that, that still stands out in your mind now, this many years later, about your father, when, you know, uh, as a young girl working at the plant? Uh, I think that the, the people who worked for the plant were very loyal, and I remember that Gus Fleischman gave me my first dog. Wow. Ah, Jumbo. From Gus. From Gus oh Fleischman. God. So I, I do remember that. One of the two brothers of Matt. Every time yeah. I hear the name, I realize, yes, that's what where you I got dog? my dog. Jumbo. Oh, okay. I'm not sure where <laughs> that came from. I thought you named it Max or something like that, you know? <laughs> and I'm right. not sure if he maybe came with that name. Uh-huh, uh-huh. That's I a good story. Remember, and how about for yourself? Uh, um, well, my dad <laughs> was in management. You know, he, he worked in every department, the gin distillery, and then uh, transportation, was manager. And his uh, sister and brother-in-law, Mo and Billy McLaughlin, they were, you know. Oh, union. You know, union. Right. And so there was tension there. They would talk <laughs> about my dad, how he's, you know. Oh, I got it, because he's a little uppy, up and up. Because yeah, he, right. was, he was management. Gotcha. Yeah. He was so. originally a union for a long time. Sure. And then uh, changed. And so. Really? Uh, and that was, he said, uh, probably the, the uh, riskiest a position he ever had in life, you know, that he actually risked losing a job, you know, if he, uh, if the management didn't like it. My name is Wayne Robinson. Um, we're here for the celebration of 150 years of Standard Brands and Fleischmann's. And uh, my family worked there for many years. My dad worked at Fleischmann's for 46 years. My uncle and my aunt worked there for 30 some odd years and my mom worked there for like 20 years. Well, back in the day, Fleischmann's was like the only place to work in Peekskill for a lot of people, and it was one of the best paying jobs in the area. And actually, my mom and dad lived on Fleischmann's Hill next door to each other, and my aunt and uncle also lived there, and they all be got married together, and we moved over to Lower South Street, and it was, a, it was great pride for me. So I was so proud of them for all the years that they were dedicated to, to Fleischmann's and how proud they were to work there. My dad started working for Fleischmann's around 1929, and he left there in 1974 when the plant was getting ready to close. He retired. I think the plant closed four years after he left, and uh, he uh, ran. He ran the East Department for. He was a foreman in the East Department for 27 years, and previous to that, he was a union worker at the East Department. Do you remember some of the stories you would come home? You anything that, that, that stands out to you? Yeah, a story that I can remember as a kid, there was a blizzard in Peekskill, and my dad had sometimes on the weekends, he had to go over and check the ovens on the yeast to make sure to, that the temperatures were at the right temperature to keep the yeast dry. And he had a 68 Fairlane, and me and him drove through the snow together and came to the plant to check the ovens. And we did it, and we made it through, and I'll never forget the smell of the yeast. When I walked in there, it's a memory that I'll never forget. Now, there were other people that I've spoken with who said, who said that, that even that smell, you know, kind of per, you know, permeated through the city of Peekskill. Yes, we lived on Lower South Street, which is not a stone's throw from the plant, and you could smell the yeast drying where we lived. So, and the train tracks separated us from the, the plant, but we lived a stone's throw. After they left the Ch Charles Point, where they lived on Fleischmann's Hill, 
They built a little house over on Lower South Street and lived there for 40 some odd years. I'm Ian Triola, and I worked in, uh, for Fleischmann's from 1964 to 1975. I started out with Mr. Andrews in the lab. I had a, a chemistry background, so we did the quality controller work. And after about a year, they asked me to come down to this, to run this building. So I was a supervisor in charge of this building from 1965 to roughly 1971. So, so for the building that we're sitting in, conducting this interview, yes. this is the building you worked in? Correct. This particular area here was uh, an area for empty bottles, okay, and of course the tanks were over to the left, uh, the right side, and the bottom lines were downstairs, and there were a total of three downstairs and two, uh, uh, one upstairs. And in one of the photos that we saw this, uh, the, uh, this afternoon, uh, we, they spoke about the, um, the rum room, which had the little nips that we put, sent to the airline, TWA and Pacific South Airline. Uh, and then we did um, Canadian bottling, a 40 ounce bottle for, for Canada, and then the regular product line downstairs, okay? So you did, so you did labeling for, 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 for these international companies, these that's, airlines. That's correct, yes. It was a big business, actually. And then it would always marvel, you talk about what, what did you see and what impressed you. I always marveled at the people who worked on the line to be able to control those little small bottles at roughly 60 bottles a minute and wow. then potentially put a label on in the back, which was uh, bottled exclusively for Pacific South Airlines or TWA. I would imagine this is someone over, over an eight hour workday or a shift, it has to be kind of almost like backbreaking and, and very, you know, uh, I would say tedious, but very, very difficult work that each day that this is, you know, this is your job and this is what you're going exactly. to do. Exactly, and the thing that always stuck in my mind is, this was the time before palletization. So the truckloads came and it, the, there would be 2,000 empty cases in a truck. And then the, uh, the individuals would be working, uh, unloading those with uh, rollers, manual rollers. And for people who live in this area, you know the wind that came down that river was really, really nasty. So in the wintertime, it was really cold out there. And they would unload, unload the 2,000 cases. They would go to the bottom line, and on the end of the line, it would be the other individuals who would load full cases of 50 pounds, 40 pounds into the truck. So it was, it was hard, hard work. And the, the, the women who worked on the line also had a difficult job because at that time, each state had their own little individual tax stamps, decals, and they would be affixed to the bottles as the bottles went down the line. See. So it would be like uh, in a particular line that I was thinking of, the half pint line, they had three women on each side of the line and they would just seamlessly take that decal, transfer it from that uh, decal backing right onto the bottle, which was wow. very, very difficult. Wow. And Thank you for your time. No problem at all. Take care. I'm Owen Hooley. Uh, I grew up in, um, in, uh, in first in Verplank and then in Montrose, which is close by here. Uh, let's see, my uncle was uh, married my mother's sister, and he was Eddie Murray, who just, uh, just uh, his daughters just preceded me. Um, I got my first job in high school at Fleshman's, and uh, that was second shift on the yeast cleanup. Uh, it was an interesting job. Uh, I mean, uh, it was a small crew, and, and the idea was work like hell for four hours, and then we'll tell stories for another four, the other four hours. But well, we got the job done. Um, a funny little story connected to that is that uh, when I was in high school, I had a bad warts, warts on my hands, warts on, I had to wear long sleeve shirts all the time. I was afraid girls would not like Owen Hooley at all because of those warts. So in, in working in Fleischmann's that summer, in the, in the East Cleanup Plan, uh, they gave you big rubber gloves, an apron, big rubber boots. I couldn't stand the gloves. My feet, hands were sweating in there. So I discarded the gloves and I'd be down in there with the scrub brushes and everything, cleaning those big stainless steel hoppers. Um, and you know something? I could have made my first million dollars there because after that summer, the warts disappeared. But Fleischmann's was a great place to work. I really was. I learned how to work at Fleischmann's. I'm a kid in high school. Um, and then, you know, continued on. Do you remember what you got paid? I, I did get paid, and the pay was pretty damn good, actually. What was it? Do you remember? No, I don't recall what it was. I can go through my records and probably find some right, stubs, but right, I right, don't right. recall it. Um, I worked in all kinds of jobs. It was a fill-in job for the summer times, you know. Right. So. Uh, um, there were a cast of characters, but everybody pulled together and everybody got along pretty well. I worked in the coal-fired powerhouse one summer 
And you know, at that time, American history was my, my thing in high school. So uh, I, got to say, I really understood that Fleischmann's was one of the essence of American history that still stood as a, uh, for the working man right there and still functioned in the years of basically the early 60s and stuff. And it was a pleasure to work there. It really was. And uh, I didn't even consider it work. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was a good place. Another funny one is uh, I had a little, uh, I like reading, so I had a little pocketbook in my back pocket one time. I'm going walking through the yard and, um, and a, uh, an engineer is bringing a, uh, just an engine through the yard. And he said, uh, hey, kid. I said, what? He says, what's in your back pocket? I said, it's, I think they call it a book. He says, man, don't let any management see that book in your back pocket. <laughs> so anyway, it went on like that. There were cast of characters there. If somebody break a case on a Friday when we're loading freight cars, uh, you know, remember Yogi and uh, the Silver Fox or something like that? You, would, uh, you wouldn't see a lot of the guys then maybe for a little bit of the day. My name is Joseph Carroll. Okay. I'm a resident of Montrose. My grandfather and my grandmother both wor worked here at Fleischmann's. And over the years, as a young boy, I always heard about how great of a base baseball player my father or grandfather was. And um, they had a team. They had a team, the Fleischmann's team, that I later on learned about last year when Bob Mayer had a presentation in Croton talking about the baseball team. He had a flyer put out with a picture. And when I looked at it, I recognized right away that it was my grandfather. Um, all the old timers from the Montrose Buchanan Verplank area always told me how great of a catcher he was. Only standing at five foot five, and he's well known for throwing people out in the squatting position. Um, he was a steamfitter by trade, uh, worked here at Stan and Brands, or excuse me, uh, Fleischmann's, uh, World War I veteran with the fight in 69th, and uh, a local volunteer fire chief in Montrose. And he was well known through the fire service, but also for his ball playing abilities to include the American Legion at a Verplank years ago. So the, 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 help me with a little bit of this. Fleischmann's had a team, right? I mean, I saw it uh, at the museum. Right. You know, a uniform. It said Fleischmann's right across right, the front. You know, one of those wool uniforms, one of the jerseys. Right. Did, were the games played amongst Fleischmann you know, teams, or was it, a, or is it, or is it a Fleischmann peak skill against another industrial team? I think team? it was the other, like almost like an industrial league, similar right. to like the Firematic league they have later on through peak skill, Buchanan, Macho, as a Verplank. Okay. Um, there was an article written by Ray Lapola, who was an old writer, sports writer in peak skill, and I have it home in a frame, and he talked about my grandfather being a well-known baseball player. And one of the things he brought up was back in the 20s when he used to catch, he would take his drinking water and mix it with the mud and put it underneath his eyes. Right. Now look what they do now with, yes. you know, maybe my grandfather had a patent on it where, you know, <laughs> uh, it right. could have went somewhere. One, you know, one last story here quickly this, uh, is also about the bowling team. You, right. you mentioned that, uh, I know in the presentation that was given earlier today that uh, there were a couple of men that you were able to identify right. from I, the bowling team. I identified Art Harkins, who my buddy, that's his, my buddy's father, another guy, Anthony Marbito, who was Mo Marbito, who was also a well-known uh, softball standout locally here within the Tri-Village Peak School area. And I guess back then with the industries, um, they picked up on the sports as a recreational type thing for the, probably for the betterment of the families that worked there. Right. right. So I do recall my grandfather always saying in the basement, don't, don't touch those bottles downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? Um, I can't tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that as a yes, that he touched the bottles.